Hi, this is JJ Singh from Partap University, and we continue discussing the textbook Elementary Algebra by John Redden. Chapter 1, Real Numbers and Their Operations. Now we're at Section 6, Exponents and Square Roots. So we're going to learn how to interpret exponential notation with positive integer exponents. So exponents that are positive integers, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. We're going to calculate the nth power of a real number, and the n and the nth power is just an, a number, like, for example, a positive integer exponent, like we were just talking about. So, the uh, if n is 2, then it's the second power, if n is 3, it's the third power. The second power is usually called the square, and the third power is called the cube n's 4, it's the 4th power, and 5, it's the 5th power, and so on, uh, of a particular real number. And thirdly, we'll calculate the exact and approximate value of the square root of a real number, and you'll learn that a square root is kind of the opposite of a square. So, let's start by um, explaining what exactly exponential notation is. You've seen situations where a number is repeated as a factor several times, uh, like in this case, 5 times 5 times 5 times 5. We can write it more compactly as 5 to the power 4, or 5 to the 4th power. Okay, and that basically means that 5 is being multiplied by itself this many times. Well, not being multiplied by itself that many times, but that's how many factors there are that are all equal to 5. The base is the factor, and the positive integer is the exponent. That exponent indicates the number of times the base is repeated as a factor. So, base 5, exponent 4, 5 to the 4th power. So if we generalize this a bit, we'd say that a is repeated as a factor n number of times, a being the base, and n being just how many uh, factors you have that are equal to a, being multiplied with each other. So if it's a to the power of 3, then you'd have a times a times a. If it's a to the power of 2, you'd have a times a. Uh, if it's a to the power 1, it's kind of an unusual situation, you would just have a. It wouldn't be multiplied by anything. A to, a to the power 1 is just equal to a. And uh, we'll learn about some more special situations later. So, when the exponent is 2, we call the result the square, like I mentioned. So, it's three, we would say 3 squared, rather than just saying Rather than saying 3 to the power 2 or 3 to the second power, we just say 3 squared equals 3 times 3 equals 9. So, the number 3 is the base here, and the integer 2 is the exponent, and the base can be any real number. It doesn't necessarily have to be an integer. It could be, let's say, a decimal number, like 3.2. So you could have 3.2 squared which is 3.2 times 3.2, and if you do the math, that's 10.24. Similarly, you could have a fraction that's squared, uh, or set to a, uh, an exponent, um, uh, set to the nth power. So here we have 3 fifths being the, uh, the, uh, the number to find the square of, so we would say 3 fifths squared equals 3 fifths times 3 fifths equals 9 20 fifths. Here, let's be a little bit careful now when we bring in negative numbers. Here you'll see that there's parentheses around negative 7. Okay, so not only is the 7 going to be squared, but the negative sign is also going to be squared. What does that mean? You're going to have negative 7 times negative 7, and we know that a negative times a negative is positive. The negatives cancel. So, 7 times 7 is 49, so we end up with positive 49. Now, here's where you'll see a, a difference. Negative 5 squared is not the same. It's not the same calculation as, as we just saw about the same kind of calculation. 
the negative is not going to be squared here. <coughs> we have a negative in front of 5 squared, which means that 5 is being squared. The base is positive 5, not negative 5. And so you still need to multiply the negative by whatever that works out to. So negative times 5 times 5 is equal to negative times 25 equals negative 25. So in this case, you don't have negatives canceling out. You have a negative that is flowing through to the end. Um, and by that, I mean the, the product, um, the, the result here also has a negative sign in front of it. So, um, now we, uh, we can see uh, this clarified a little bit further, uh, illustrated a bit. Negative 5 squared equals negative 1 times 5 squared, which is the same as negative times 5 squared. Negative 1 times 5 times 5, which equals negative 25. And so this distinction between whether you have parentheses or not is very important because it affects the sign of the result, the positive or negative sign. The textual notation for exponents is usually denoted using the caret symbol. If you've ever used uh, software like Microsoft Excel, you've probably seen um, this caret sign, which is like a, it doesn't look like a vegetable, the caret, it just looks like, uh, I guess, the top part of a diamond uh, shape. And um, so 8 squared is shown as 8 caret 2 which is 8 times 8, which is 64. Negative 5.1 squared would be negative 5.1 caret 2. Now, again, remember that there's no parentheses here, so you're not squaring negative 5.1, you're squaring 5.1, and then you're multiplying that by negative, so your result is negative, negative 26.01. The sum of an integer, I'm sorry, the square of an integer is called a perfect square. Okay, so here we're not talking about decimals or fractions, we're just going back to integers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. The square of all those integers is a perfect square. And actually, you should memorize the squares of all those integers. There's a list of them right here, including uh, the square of 0. So 0 squared is 0, 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, and so on. Uh, 25, 36, 49, 64, 81, 100, 121, 144, 169, 196, 225. So those are the squares of those integers from uh, 1 to 15, and actually 0 as well. Okay, now let's try an example which we'll have to do in our head because it's not shown here. We're going to simplify negative 12 parentheses squared. Okay, to differentiate between negative 12 squared, I'm saying negative 12 parentheses squared. The negative must be multiplied by another negative, canceling it out to form a positive in the result. 12 squared is 144, so your result is 144 from the product of negative 12 times negative 12. When the exponent is 3, we call the result a cube. For example, 3 cubed is 3 times 3 times 3, equals 27. And you could say that a cube is uh, three-dimensional, speaking of 3. Um, the notation 3 cubed can be read either 3 cubed, which is the way we normally read it, or 3 raised to the third power. And we would normally just say 3 cubed. So let's say we have a fraction now that's being cubed, 2 fifths being cubed. We have 2 fifths times 2 fifths times 2 fifths, which is equal to 8 over 125 or so, 8 1 25ths. Uh, if you have a negative number cubed, now, in this case, negative 7 times negative 7 times negative 7 is negative 7 cubed, uh, parentheses cubed, pardon me. Um, notice here that the two of those negative signs will cancel out to form a positive, but you still have, you have an odd number of negative signs, so you're still going to have negative negativity prevailing in the result. 
and 7 times 7 times 7 equals 49 times 7 equals 343. So your result is negative 343. Okay, now we, we take away parentheses to show you that negative 4 cubed equals negative 4 times 4 times 4, uh, which equals negative 64. In this case, um, we do have a negative in the result and you did in the previous example as well so um, in this case what you would actually see is that if it was negative four parentheses cubed you would have the exact same answer as if it if there's no parentheses because the power is uh, an odd number the three is an odd number you can have an odd um, if you have parentheses, you have an odd number of factors like the negative sevens in the example right above. And so with an odd number of factors, you have an odd number of negative signs. So all the pairs that are one less than that odd number, um, those cancel out. And you're, you're left with an extra negative sign, which makes the result negative. If that's confusing you, don't worry, because I kind of mumbled on a little bit there. Okay, so note that the result of cubing a negative number is negative. The cube of an integer is called a perfect cube. And so you should memorize the cubes of the integers from 1 to 10. We'll also include 0 in this list. So 0 cubed is 0, 1 cubed is, is 1, 2 cubed is 8, 3 cubed is 27, 4 cubed is 64, 5 cubed is 125, 6 cubed is 216, uh, 7 cubed is 343, 8 cubed is 512, 9 cubed is 729, 10 cubed is 1000. Okay, and this might be a little bit harder to memorize than the squares, uh, but it's it's worth it, because sometimes you'll see these numbers. More likely to see the smaller ones than the bigger ones, but, uh, well, you definitely will see 1000 being 10 cubed a lot. And you'll notice that you take 10 to the power of something, you end up with the, the same number of zeros as that power. So 10 squared is 100. Is two, there's two zeros in 100, which is the same number as the number of the power that you, you raised the 10 to, which was 2. 10 cubed, similarly, three zeros. 10 to the power of 4 would have four zeros, would be 10,000, and so on. Okay, so negative 2 parenthesis cubed we have negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 and the first negative 2 times negative 2 the negatives cancel and you end up with positive 4 and then you multiply positive 4 by negative 2 and you end up with negative 8 if the exponent is greater than 3 then the notation a to the n is read a raised to the nth power or, like I just said, a to the n. It's probably better to say a raised to the nth power. So, 10 raised to the 6th power um, is 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. And you end up with a million, which has six zeros in it, like I was just alluding to a moment ago. Negative 1 parenthesis to the power 4, or raised to the 4th power. Again, you have four factors which are the base so these four factors here are all the negative one that is the base you have an even number of negative signs so you you can pair off uh, the negative signs you have and cancel them all off into positives leaving the result being positive and of course one times one times one times one is one so the answer is positive one Taking a fraction to the power of 5, in this case 1 third to the power of 5, you have 1 third being multiplied by itself, the number of factors there being 5, and each factor is the same, 1 third, and so you end up with the result 1 243rds, or 1 over 243. Now, notice that the result of a negative base with an even exponent is positive. Okay, so like I was saying, if the exponent is an even number, you have an even number of those negative signs, and so you'll end up with a bunch of pairs of negative signs, all of which will 
cancel out and you'll end up with a positive result. If you had a negative base with an odd exponent, the result would be negative because you'd have a bunch of pairs of negative signs, but then you'd have an extra negative at the end to, to make it an odd number. Uh, basically, an odd number is one more than an even number, right? So, like, 32 is an even number that consists of a bunch of pairs in it, but 33 is one more than that. So after all those pairs, negative signs cancel out, you still have the 33rd negative sign, which does not cancel with anything. So that means the result has to be negative, because negative times positive is negative. Okay, um, so just be careful with that stuff. Um, you'll get the hang of it with some time. Uh, let's look at some more examples here. The base is negative 2, and you're taking negative 2 to the power 4. So you have an even number of negative signs. They'll all form pairs of negative signs, all of which will cancel out. And you'll be left with the result positive 16, because 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16. Similarly, negative 2 parenthesis cubed, um, you end up with an odd number of negative signs, so the result is negative, and 2 times 2 times 2 is 8, so the result is negative 8. Looking on the other side where the base is 2, you have a negative in front of 2 to the power 4, or you have a negative in front of 2 cubed. Here, notice that all the factors are positive numbers, and they get multiplied by a negative at the end. So, all those positives multiplied with each other, like the, the four twos, they form a positive result, positive 16, but then you have to multiply by a negative, so you have a negative result, negative 16. And so, in all of these cases, you'll have a negative result. Um, like in this second example as well, negative times 2 times 2 times 2 is negative 8. The parentheses indicate that the negative number is to be used as the base. Okay, no parentheses, you're not using a negative number as the base. What is negative one-third, parentheses cubed, and what is negative one-third, parentheses to the power four? Well, the base is going to be negative one-third in each case. So, in the first example, you have three factors, all, all of whom are, all of which are negative one-third. And so you have an odd number of negative signs, your result is negative, and one-third times one-third third times one-third is one-twenty-seventh. If uh, you had that factor being multiplied by itself, uh, you, if you had that factor four times, um, you'd have an even number of negative signs, so they'd all, they'd all cancel out in pairs to become a positive result. And you'd have one one third times one third times one third times one third, which equals one over eighty one. So it would be positive one over eighty one. Okay, so now let's try negative ten to the four to the fourth power, and negative ten parentheses to the fourth power. Well, in the first case, remember that the negative sign is not being incorporated into the exponent calculation. The negative sign is just going to be multiplied by the result. So um, 10 to the power 4, the result is going to be 10,000, right? Because there's going to be four zeros in it, which is 10,000 with a 1 at the beginning. That's 10,000. And so you have to multiply that by the negative sign, you get negative 10,000. In the second case, you do have negative signs in each of the um, four factors, but there's an even number of factors, so there's an even number of negative signs, so there's so there's just pairs of negative signs, and so the pairs all cancel out to become positive, and you you get left with a positive result, which is 10 to the power 4, which is 10,000, so positive 10,000. What is the square root of a real number? You just think of it as the opposite of finding the square. 
the inverse means the opposite, okay? So to determine the square root of 25, the question is what number squared equals 25? And you don't want to be thinking just about the, the positive number that, that can be squared to result in this positive uh, 25. But you also have to remember that a negative number squared is going to result in a positive number. So you can have 5 being squared to result in 25, or you could have negative 5 parentheses squared to form 25. If you just think about the positive of these two uh, uh, answers, that being positive 5, um, that is called the principal square root, which is the non-negative square root. Okay, so and that's usually what is implied uh, when people ask for the square root, uh, but not necessarily. Okay, if somebody says I want all the solutions to square root of uh, 25, then they want to know about 5 and negative 25, okay? But um, usually, if they just ask you, well, what's the square root of 25? They, you can usually take that to mean just the 5, the, prin that the principal square root. So, in this case, the generalization is the square root of a squared equals a if a is a non-negative number, a is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, or more generally, the square root of a squared equals the absolute value of a. So, um, if a is positive five, absolute value of positive five is five. If a is negative five, the absolute value of negative five is also five. It's just the distance from the origin, which is five units. So that's your principal square root. And this is just a rehash of what we just talked about. Square root of 25 equals 5. Uh, the symbol for the square root sign is this symbol that you see here um, above the uh, 25, as, as it just was above the a squared in the previous line. So the symbol um, is called the radical sign, and 25 is called the radicand, although nobody really says that, so... I don't really care that it's called a radicand, but I guess you have to learn that for answering some of the questions you'll have. Um, and the alternative textual notation is, and this is something, again, seen in software like Microsoft Excel, SQRT, and then putting 16 in parentheses, um, that is the square root of 16, as you would type it into Excel. And that's used quite frequently. I use it all the time when I'm using Excel. So um, it's also worthwhile to note the square root of 1 is 1, okay, because 1 times 1 is 1, and the square root of 0 is 0. We get 0 times 0 is 0. So 1 squared is 1 and 0 squared is 0. And that's why you have the inverse being what they are. Square root of 10,000, it's a perfect square. Um, you have a hundred times a hundred forming ten thousand. So the answer there is a hundred. And you notice that a um, hundred has two zeros in it, and a hundred has, and the other factor a hundred also has two zeros in it, of course, because it's the same number. The product of those is ten thousand with, with four zeros in it. So what is that telling you? Does that mean that you add how many zeros there are in each of the factors? 2 plus 2 equals 4? Could it be? And yes, you'll realize that it is just adding those up. So 10 squared, remember that 100 is a number starting with 1 that has two zeros, so it's the same as 10 to the power 2. two 10 squared times 10 squared equals 10 to the 4, you can also calculate by adding up the exponents and keep if you have the same base. So 10 squared times 10 squared, it's a multiplication here, but it's an addition of the exponents. The 2 and the 2. 2 plus 2 equals 4, so that's equal to 10 to the power of 4. 
as we'll see uh, later on, it'll be quite important. So um, there's just the rehash of square root of 10,000 being 100. Now let's say we retain the square root of a fraction 1 9th. And uh, we know that 9 is a perfect square of 3, right? And 1 is a perfect square of 1. So actually, the fractions 1 3rd times 1 3rd are equal to 1 9th. And that's something that you just kind of have to think about, I guess. That's the best way to do it. Um, there are other ways, which we'll get into as well, to make things easier, like um, taking the square root considering the square root of the whole fraction to be equal to the square root of 1 divided by the square root of 9, which it turns out that that's how we can calculate the example, uh, I mean the, the answer. Um, if you're given a and b as positive real numbers, we're going to use the following property to simplify square roots whose radicands are not squares. Square root of a, b, or a times b, is equal to the square root of a times the square root of b. So if you have a, um, uh, you identify the largest square factor of the radicand and then apply the property shown above. Uh, as an example, to simplify a square root of 8, note that 8 is not a perfect square, but 8 is equal to 4 times 2, and 4 is a perfect square. Um, so from the 4, from the square root of 4, as you'll see here, this is how we split it up, just like we were talking about. Square root of a times b equals square root of a times square root of b. So square root of 8 equals square root of 4 times 2 equals square root of 4 times square root of 2. And we can simplify the square root of 4 to being 2. And so your result is 2 root 2. That's the quick way of saying it. Or you could say 2 times square root of 2. But it's easier just to say 2 root 2. Here, 2 root 2 is a simplified irrational number, because if you, we know that if you take the square root of 2, you'll end up with an irrational number that just goes on forever, and even if you multiply that by the 2 in front, you'll still have an irrational number that goes on forever. So you're going to look in this case, you don't have to, but what what's asked of you is to find an approximate answer, round it off to a certain decimal place, and uh, you can find that with a calculator. Um, so square root of 8 equals 2 times root 2. If you put root 2 into a calculator, you get something like 1.4, etc. And so that 1.4 times 2 equals 2.83. Well, it's approximately equal to 2.83. You get the squiggly uh, equal sign. So now if you try... 2.83 to the power 2, what do you get? Well, you're expecting to get 8, right? But you're not going to get exactly 8 because it's an approximate. Okay, so it's important to mention that the radicand must be positive. You can't take the square root of a negative number uh, unless you have it a vivid imagination. And I use the word imagination because there are imaginary numbers, which we're not going to talk about, that are involved with the square root of negative numbers. So there is no real number that when squared is negative. So imaginary number is different than a real number. Um, and your calculator would just freak out with an error if you tried to t take the square root of a negative number. Um, so, uh, but we, but later on in the course, you will learn about imaginary numbers a bit. Simplify and give an approximate answer rounded to the nearest hundredth of square root of 75. Well, let's break 75 into some primes to help see if there's any perfect squares in there. 75 is equal to 25 times 3, and 25 times 3 is equal to 5 times 5 times 3. So 25 is a perfect square. So we can split up this root 75 into root um, square root of 25 times 3, which equals root 25 times root 3, and that equals 5 times root 3. And with the calculator, you can find out what root 3 is. 
uh, multiply that by 5, and it's approximately equal to 8.66, rounded off to the nearest hundredth, which is the second decimal place. As a check, calculate root 75 and 5 root 3 on a calculator and verify that both results are approximately 8.66. Well, both of those results will be exactly the same, uh, and they won't be exactly equal to 8.66, but they will be approximately equal to that. Simplify root 180. Okay, so let's try breaking up into primes now. Um, 180 is equal to 36 times 5, which equals 6 times 6 times 5. So 36 is a perfect square. Um, you pull that out. You make it a uh, root 36 times root 5, which is 6 times root 5. And the question here did not ask for an approximate answer. So we can present the exact answer, which is 6 root 5. Or you could say 6 times the square root of 5. Now let's simplify negative 5 times root 162. Again, I want to um, pull out some primes if I can from the 162. Uh, notice it's 81 times 2, and 81 times 2 is 9 times 9 times 2. And I'm not going to break down the 9 times 9 times 2 into 3 times 3 times 3 times 3 times 2 because the 9 times 9, that is enough to tell us that 81 is a perfect square. So let's just break this down into negative 5 times root 81 times root 2, which is negative 5 times 9 times root 2, which is negative 45 root 2. And that's our answer. Um, now, what if we were asked to simplify and give an approximate answer rounded to the nearest hundredth? Similar process. Here we have root 128, and you can break that up into 64, uh, 128 can be broken up into 64 times 2. 64 is a perfect square of 8. So this is equal to root 64 times root 2, which equals 8 times root 2. And with the calculator, root 2 is about 1.4 or something. Multiply that by 8, and you'll get something approximately equal to 11.31. Pythagoras is a guy from a long time ago, like you can see here by the clothing he's wearing. A right triangle is a triangle where one of the angles is 90 degrees. The side opposite of that 90 degree angle is the longest side of the triangle, and it's called the hypotenuse. The other two sides are legs. So here we indicate a right angle by having this little... Uh, square in that angle. Okay, that is how you show that this is a right uh, right angle, and so it's a right triangle. And so C is the hypotenuse because that's the side opposite that angle. A and B are the legs, and Pythagoras figured out that um, A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. And so if you uh, solve for C, you'll get that uh, you take the square root of both sides of this equation and so you get that c is equal to the root of the sum of a squared plus b squared so if the two legs of a right triangle measure three and four units what's the length of the hypotenuse so we know that a equals three and b equals four or it might be b equals three and a equals four but it doesn't really matter in this case so we're going to find the c to be the square root of the sum of a squared plus b squared, and that's equal to the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared, which is the square root of 9 plus 16, which is the square root of 25, which is equal to uh, 5, Wait, because 25 is a perfect square of 5. So when finding the hypotenuse of a right triangle using the Pythagorean theorem, the radicand is not always a perfect square. In this case, it, it was, but let's look at a case where it isn't. Let's say instead of the, the lengths of those legs being 3 and 4, let's say they're 2 and 6. So then we'd have c equals the square root of the sum of a squared plus b squared being c equals the square root of 2 squared plus 6 squared, which is 4 plus 36, which is 40. So we're looking for the root of 40. Let's break up 40 into some primes, if we can. Uh, 40 equals 4 times 10. 
we don't have to break up any further because we know that 4 is a perfect square. So let's pull that 4 out. We'll have uh, root of 4 times 10 equal to root 4 times root 10, root 4 being 2, root 10 still being root 10. So the exact answer is 2 root 10. And if you're asked to approximate it, you can use a calculator to find root 10 and multiply that by 2 and round off to the number of decimal places you're asked to. So summaries from this segment, um, when you, using exponential notation a to the power n, the base a is used as a factor n number of times. When the exponent is 2, the result is called the square. When the exponent is 3, the result is called the cube. So um, you should memorize the squares of integers up to 15 and the cubes of integers up to 2. I'm um, sorry, up to 10. They'll often be used as you progress in your study of algebra, although not all of them. Just memorize as many of those as you can. And, you know, if you, if you don't get some of them right away, that's okay. Um, if you can't remember some of them at the beginning, you will ultimately remember a lot of them because you will see them over and over again. When negative numbers are involved, take care to associate the exponent with the correct base, parentheses group, a negative number raised to some power. A negative base raised to an even power is positive. A negative base raised to an odd power is negative. Okay, so why is that? A negative base raised to an even power, you have an even number of odd numbers. So there's pairs of negative signs, which all cancel out to become positive. A negative base raised to an odd power is negative because in addition to those pairs of negative signs, you have an extra negative sign at the end because an odd number is one more than an even number. So you have one more negative. Then you would have to have uh, just pairs that cancel out. So your result has to be negative because you're going to have a negative times a positive, and a negative times a positive is a negative. The square root of a number is a number that, when squared, results in the original number. The principal square root is the positive square root. Simplify a square root by looking for the largest perfect square factor of the radicand, which is whatever is under the shelter of the square root sign, that's the radicand. Um, so break that radicand up into factors, uh, one of which is hopefully a perfect square, ideally and the biggest possible perfect square possible so that you can take the most out of the the square root sign and put it out front and take the square root root of it so once a perfect square is found let's say uh, a is a perfect square so we're going to pull a out of there root of a times b or root of a b equals root a times root b where a and b are non-negative and then you simplify Check simplify square roots by calculating approximations of the answer using both the original problem and the simplified answer on calculator to verify the results are the same, and they will be. And find the length of the hypotenuse of any right triangle given the lengths of the legs using the Pythagorean theorem. Here's your practice questions. The odd numbered questions have answers to them, except for the discussion board questions at the end. So let's just look at those discussion board topics. Why is the result of an exponent of 2 called a square, and why is the result of an exponent of 3 called a cube? Well, this exponent of 2 is called a square because essentially you learn in geometry that a square has a length and a width that are equal to each other, and so you end up with an area, basically, if you're calculating length times a width, you're calculating an area of a two-dimensional figure, which is a square with each length the same. So what if you have an exponent of 2? Let's say you have 3 squared. What's the length of each of those sides of the square? Well, they're each equal to 3, right? And so you're actually calculating the area in that square, which is 3 squared, which is 9. 9 like inches, 9 square inches, or 9 square centimeters, or something like that. You may have seen markings indicating square inches, square centimeters. Um, so that's why it's called a square, because if you visualized it, you would see a shape that is a square. And you'd be calculating the area of that shape because it's in two dimensions. What, why is the result of an exponent of 3 called a cube? Well, similarly, here you're going to have three dimensions, length, width, and height, which are all equal to each other. So like, if you had 3 cubed, 
you'd have a cube, like an ice cube, not the wrapper, but uh, the ice cube that is formed by frozen water in a freezer. And uh, if you have a, a perfectly shaped ice cube, which none of them ever are, but anyway, let's say they were, um, you'd notice that the length and the width and the height, if it's actually cubes, some of them are actually different dimensions. I'm making this more complicated than it should be. Um, you have, if you have a cube with the length and the width and the height all being equal, it's it's considered a cube shape, and you'd be finding a volume there because it's in three dimensions by multiplying three times three times three, or length times width times height, and in that case it would be 27 cubic centimeters or cubic inches. Research and discuss the history of the Pythagorean theorem. Research and discuss the history of the square root. Those are both interesting questions. I don't know if you'll have time to look at them, though. Discuss the importance of the principal square root. Um, well, generally speaking, we uh, we have situations like like the one we were just talking about, where you had three squared, uh, and the area of that is nine. So, if you have a square with area nine and you want to find out the length of each side of that square, you would take the square root, but you'd only be looking for the principal square root. You wouldn't care that negative 3 squared is equal to 9, because here you can't have a length or a width being a negative number. And so that's why these positive answers end up being more important, and uh, these, these principal square roots end up being more important. And that's the section.